Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, we finally discovered what Denisovan human faces look like as a skull belonging to these ancient people has been identified, a new species of prehistoric monster saw has been found in Utah, humpback whales may be trying to communicate with us using bubbles, and much more. Our top story this week is the discovery of a Denisovan face, as an ancient hominin skull from northeastern China has been identified as belonging to one of these extinct humans. The Denisovans are a lineage of archaic humans that were most closely related to the Neanderthals, and were first realised to exist only in 2010, after DNA from an unknown human was detected in a finger bone found in Denisova Cave in Siberia. Since then, more bits and pieces of Denisovan bones have been retrieved from the cave, including teeth, scraps of long bones, and fragments of skulls. In 2019, a partial mandible found on the Tibetan Plateau was reported to come from a Denisovan as well. And then, in April of 2025, another partial mandible dredged up from waters around Taiwan was also identified as Denisovan. Many genetic studies of living human populations in Asia and Oceania have also shown that Denisovan DNA is carried by some modern humans, indicating that our species interbred with these mysterious hominins in the past as populations of Homo sapiens spread to regions where they already lived. So up until now we didn't have much fossil material to go on when it came to working out what these people would have looked like, although estimates of their appearance using known genetic data have been conducted it could be assumed that they were probably overall fairly similar to Neanderthals, as they were close relatives. But the details of their faces have remained a mystery until now. This new discovery has revealed that an entire hominin skull, known as the Harbin Cranium, is in fact the skull of a Denisovan. The Harbin Cranium was uncovered in northeastern China and is more than 146,000 years old. And the researchers involved with this new study were able to extract mitochondrial DNA from the dental calculus preserved on the single tooth remaining in the skull, after attempts to get DNA from the actual bone and tooth were unsuccessful. Dental calculus is the hardened plaque that builds up on the teeth, and since this plaque absorbs fluids from the mouth, it incorporates some DNA into it. This mitochondrial DNA was found to closely match the genetic signals extracted from bones in Denisova Cave, so the Harbin skull is undoubtedly that of a Denisovan. More specifically, the Harbin individual was most closely related to the older Denisovans known from the cave, those that lived between about 123 to 217,000 years ago, rather than the younger ones that existed between 52 and 84,000 years ago, which does make sense considering the Harbin cranium is from a very ancient Denisovan. Now, the interesting twist here is that the Harbin cranium has already been scientifically named. You may remember that back in 2021, a new species of human from China was described, called Homo longi, the Dragon Man. Homo longi was suggested to be a sister lineage to our own species that coexisted with ancient Homo sapiens, and was named based solely on the anatomy of the skull, without any genetic samples being taken. While the paper naming Homo longi did discuss the similarities to known Denisovan tooth anatomy, they still considered it to be something different. But now, with this pretty solid genetic evidence, it turns out that Homo longi and Denisovans are the same thing, and some people had been suspecting that ever since the Dragon Man was published. So does this mean that Denisovans should now technically be called Homo longi? Some researchers have said yes, but others are less certain, and the paper itself doesn't touch on that issue, so we'll have to wait and see how it gets sorted. It does now mean that the Denisovans have a face, even if it's one we've known for the last four years, since it's the Dragon Man's face. These ancient people would have had proportionally broad and quite low faces with very large brow ridges, as well as relatively flat lower faces and cheekbones that were not particularly robust. The overall remarkably large size of the head also implies that they may have had pretty big bodies too. The discovery of a Denisovan skull means that more ancient human remains can now be more easily identified as belonging to these hominins, even when ancient DNA cannot be extracted, because their anatomy can be compared. The study also lists several other known fossils that appear to share some traits with the Harbin skull, suggesting that there may be many more Denisovan remains than we'd previously realised. This is a truly groundbreaking study and a wonderful addition to the fascinating story of Denisovan research.
Also in the news this week, a new species of monster saw has been discovered. And yes, that is a real name for a real group of animals I did check. Monstersaurs are a lineage of lizards that still exist today and include the beaded lizards, the most well known of which is the Gila monster. This new monstersaur species lived around 76 million years ago and was found in southern Utah, where it coexisted with some iconic dinosaurs. It's been named Bolg Amondol after the fictional goblin prince Bolg in The Hobbit, while the species name comes from the elvish Sindarin words meaning mound head, describing the bony mounds on its skull. If you've ever doubted that all paleontologists are nerds, there's your proof. What a brilliant name, honestly. Bolg was a pretty formidable lizard, reaching nearly a meter in length, almost three feet, roughly the size of a savanna monitor lizard. The known fossils are partial, but a good amount of the body is represented. Living in an ecosystem dominated by large dinosaurs, Bolg and other monstersaurs probably acted as predators of smaller creatures and eggs. And its discovery also suggests there could have been many other big lizards inhabiting these environments during the Cretaceous, which we have yet to uncover. What a fantastic discovery. We've got more brilliant paleo news coming up next as the oldest definitive docodontin has just been found. And just what exactly is a docodontin, you may ask? Well, they're a lineage of very cool, not quite mammals that lived alongside the dinosaurs, from the start of the Jurassic period until partway through the Cretaceous. Since they were not yet true mammals, we call them mammaliaforms. The docodontins were one of the first mammaliaform groups to split off from all the others, and throughout their evolution, they radiated into some remarkably diverse forms, including swimming otter-like species, tree-climbing squirrel-like ones, and even burrowing species. This new docodontin has been uncovered in East Greenland and named Nudgelacodon cassiopeia. This tiny mammalia form is known from a very small partial jaw with a couple of teeth still embedded within. The animal is early Jurassic in age, as it dates to the very first stage of time in the period, pushing back the origin of the lineage even further than previously appreciated. It also further supports evidence suggesting that the docodontins likely originated in Greenland or Europe which were joined together in the supercontinent Pangaea, itself in the process of breaking up around this time. An astonishing new fossil find. Also in the recent prehistoric news, a new species of marine reptile has been named. This is a new kind of ichthyosaur, the aquatic reptiles that lived during the age of the dinosaurs, many species of which looked superficially similar to dolphins. This species is the most complete ichthyosaur skeleton so far discovered in the early Jurassic of North America, coming from rocks in British Columbia, Canada. It's called Fernitator prentisii and was first discovered in 1916, having been in the collection of the Canadian Museum of Nature for over a century. Fernitator was a sizable creature, probably reaching between 3 to 4 meters in length, or about 10 to 13 feet. The skeleton includes much of the body and a partial skull missing the snout, and it dates to a stage of the early Jurassic during which ichthyosaurs are rarely found worldwide, as they were seemingly not often preserved during this stretch of time. It also coexisted with another ichthyosaur classified as Ichthyosaurus itself, so it's interesting that evidence of the larger Fernitator living at this particular time in North America now exists too. Another great find. In other news this week, the first images captured by the new Vera C. Rubin Observatory have been released. The facility is located in Chile, in a very remote, very dark place, to help the telescope seek the most elusive objects in the night sky. The team at the observatory have stated that, in just 10 hours, the Vera C. Rubin Observatory had detected over 2,000 new asteroids, demonstrating its extraordinary capability. For the next decade, it will take constant, massive and detailed images of the night sky, which will help us get a much clearer view of the more elusive objects in our solar system and beyond. There is even hope that it will be able to detect a ninth planet in our solar system if it exists, just within the next 12 months. The observatory will also be able to help scientists understand some of the questions they have about dark matter and dark energy, the somewhat controversial forms of matter and energy that it is currently believed dominate our universe, yet we know very little about them. Whatever this new facility discovers, we look forward to reporting it here on 7 Days of Science. Also in the news, a recently published paper announced the exciting discovery that humpback whales might be trying to communicate with humans using bubbles. Researchers at the SETI Institute, that is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and the University of California reported on a dozen ring production episodes involving 39 bubble rings produced by 11 individual humpback whales, when in the presence of humans. 
they found that the bubbles used to communicate with us are quite a different shape from those used when humpbacks communicate with one another. The researchers identified specific patterns of bubbles that were only produced when the whales were in the company of a boat or a swimmer, and they did not blow bubbles in this way to communicate with other whales. SETI researchers are interested in this phenomenon because communication attempts by intelligent, aquatic, non-human animals on Earth could be used to help them develop new ways of filtering cosmic signals for signs of extraterrestrial communication. As aliens might not communicate in ways that would inherently make sense to humans, this is a brilliant way to further our understanding of alternative methods that a non-human intelligence could use in their attempt to make contact. Rather incredible that humpbacks may be trying to say hello to us, and a fascinating idea that they could potentially one day help us to understand an alien language. And in other cetacean news, the endangered southern resident orcas, found in the waters of the Salish Sea in the Pacific, have been observed by drone to massage each other with bits of kelp. These awesome marine predators bite off the end of a kelp stalk and then fashion it to the correct length. They then position the kelp on their snouts and approach their partner to press their head and the kelp against their partner's flank. The two whales then swim closely together to keep the kelp between them while rolling it across their bodies. This extraordinary behaviour is the first evidence of tool making among marine mammals. As for why the orcas are doing this, the researchers think that it is part of their social bonding and may also serve to maintain skin health by helping to remove dead skin during molting, quite literally using it to scratch an itch. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Be sure to email us at 7 dosstories at gmail.com if you have any research you'd like to see us cover, or if you want to know how we can improve the show. You can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Kawam, Chippy Chippy Chappa Chappa, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Bather, Diana Hernandez, Drov Shrivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, I Rage, John French, Joseph Ree, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Priyaprajika Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Patrikas, Schlom, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedrow, and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week.